Hi, everybody. This is Steve Ludwig, host of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture at PlanetLudwig.com. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Brian Hyland, whose first number one hit in 1960 was the classic pop song Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. It was quickly followed by Sealed with a Kiss, which became another classic. Brian has been recording for 60 years. He's worked with Leon Russell, members of the band, Garth Hudson and Rick Danko, Del Shannon, and scores of others. What follows is an edited version of the longer classic pop culture show, number 139. That show includes many of Brian's best love songs. This edited version includes 37 minutes of only the interviews. It was recorded on March 5th, 2020. I'd like to thank Oscar from Discover Hollywood, as well as Brian's son, Bodie, for helping to set up the interview, and also the kind people of the Facebook page Brian Highland Fan Club for their support. As we start, I had just played Brian's brand new song, One Beautiful Day. And now, enjoy. Could you tell us about one beautiful day, which uh, which we just heard. Well, it's uh, I, I just had this. Uh, it, it's kind of a long, kind of an odd story, but uh, I heard. Uh, I guess it was back in the nineteen nineties uh, when uh, I heard a report that uh, Paul McCartney, on the last day that he spent with his wife uh, Linda Eastman. And they, he said, we went horseback riding, and it was a beautiful day. And then our head went downhill. But we had that one beautiful day together, riding home. I don't know where it went. And I thought, that's a, that's a great sentiment for a, for a song. Just, and, uh, and the construction of an arrangement, too, that uh, you'll, you'll uh, have different decisions. And now with, with computers... You can make decisions on things like that at any point in the process, which is, you know, it makes uh, music today a lot uh, more flexible yeah. in, you know, in creating it, because you can change things around. And, uh, but it can also be a curse, too, because you can keep tinkering with things and, and ruin it. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. got to know when mm. you have, when, it, when it's complete, and then just, that's it. That, that's got to be a tough thing, too. Like, okay, stop it now. The song is as good as I want it. And you're probably, <laughs> being a perfectionist, I can see a, a songwriter like yourself saying, well, let me just add a little something else. It's got to be tough knowing when to stop. There are there are some people who can songs with Del Shannon. Uh, we wrote a bunch of songs. And uh, sometimes I would get depressed or, you know, I'd say, ah, you know, and he said, listen, right now, someone is out there writing a song, and that's our competition, so let's get to it. Let's mm. finish this song. And, uh, you know, and that was a really good thing that it made me feel better. And uh, Yeah, good and advice. That, that's what you got to think about, that there's all these other people out there right now writing songs, doing uh, in the recording sessions, you know, the yeah. whole thing. Uh, another such a clever idea that you had your, your triple threat EPs. You have a series of those, a few volumes. What a clever idea! Could you explain the whole idea behind your triple threat EPs? Well, that was my wife's uh, Rosemary. That was her idea. Uh, you know, to because uh, we were thinking that in a way that the music business has now gone back to when I first got in, where people are attracted to one song. And, you know, and so we extended that a little bit. So we have like three songs on some of them. Uh, and most of them have three songs. But uh, so we figured people can focus better, you know, on something like that as opposed to a whole album or, you know, a whole CD, putting a whole CD out, which I think uh, really, in a way, uh, ruined a lot of, uh, you know, 
this kind of people's idea about records because they were getting like two good songs and then like uh, 10 or 11 B sides. Like yeah. It was called, the C, you know, just a CD package. And so I think getting back to just focusing on one song, two songs or something like that is a much better uh, kind of thing. Uh, and now on a purely um, selfish level, I do, however, miss albums, the physical albums looking at the, reading the album sleeves, and it's, that's something that I don't know. I mean, I know vinyl's making a comeback, Brian, but do you yourself as an artist, I mean, that was part of the, representing your message, your album cover. Do you miss albums as well? People that, that created the albums and the concepts, and, you know, a lot of them, remember, they had, like, fold-out albums. That was really cool. Yep. And you could add a bunch of uh, other information in there, and you could have the lyrics, uh, right there, yep. and uh, you know some kind of visual. Some of them had like, like uh, for instance, uh, Eric uh, Derek and the Dominoes had like a weird painting on the cover of that one. But yes, yeah, Layla in it. And uh, but there was a lot of uh, the Beatles albums and uh, Sergeant you know, Pepper. They, it was yes. like a, it was an art form. Mm -hmm. With these, I, I just want to make a couple of uh, comments about continued comments about these triple threat EPs. First of all. I am so happy that you revisited If Mary's There. To me, Brian, that is one of the saddest. Oh, I, 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 I love the original, and I am so glad you revisited it. And your new version of it, at least from 2011, the 2011 acoustic version, it's just beautiful. It's heart-wrenching. Is that always one of your favorite songs to do? Yes, it was, and... Uh... Uh, there was a promoter, the idea came to me for that. Uh, we played a show over in Hong Kong with uh, Bobby Goldsboro and uh, and Lobo, I think, was on the show. Yeah, yeah Lobo. And it was the three of us. And uh, we played at this big uh, place, the big uh, Coliseum kind of place there. And uh, the promoter requested, he said, Brian, why don't you do uh, If Mary's There? I really like that song. It was on my... Um, uh, greatest hits thing that they that they released it was uh, on on Uni uh, MCA Records. Anyway, so I did it on that show and I I worked it up and made it. I wrote up chord chart for the band and I played it. And then when I got back home, I thought well, I should you know revisit like you just said revisit that song and uh, you know do it uh, uh, you know add add something to it. Uh, because I didn't have like the uh, Stan Applebaum <laughs> string arrangement, he was fantastic, by the way. Uh, and he did all the stuff for the Drifters and and Benny King. Mm -hmm. He's a great arranger. I think he's still alive. And uh, but uh, anyways, I couldn't do that, so I just kind of miniaturized it, and I used my guitar, and I had some uh, some samples of, of of string string sections, and so I wrote some things in there for that. And then I tried to add something uh, so that it wouldn't end so abruptly, too. And uh, yeah. so it, it worked out pretty cool. Loved it. Uh, listeners, please check. I mean, check out all the volumes of the Triple Threat EPs. You can find all that info on brianhyland.com. And, and like we just mentioned, Spotify, um, CD Baby, iTunes, um, Amazon. Yeah, music, but, too. Oh, just fantastic. Um <laughs> You did a, uh, for me, a killer acoustic version of Sealed with a Kiss on a Triple Threat EP, number one, I, volume one, I believe. Now, I'm wondering if uh, how a slowed down version of acoustic itsy bitsy would sound. I, <laughs> if, if, if anyone could do it, if anyone could pull it off, you could do it, Brian. But uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> if it ever happened, but be until it happens. Um, can we go back and talk about the original Itsy Bitsy T D Weenie Yellow Polka Dr. Bikini for a few minutes? Sure. <laughs> uh, I'm, let's see. How many millions of times have you talked about the song, first of all? So I appreciate you indulging me. Um, who is the female? Two, three, four. Skip. Who is it in that song? That, but her name was Trudy Packer. Trudy mm -hmm. Packer was her name. And uh, she just... Uh, she just did that, you know. It was written on the on the sheet for the for the you know the arrangement that the for the vo the vocal arrangement in the studio, and she was perfect. She did had, great. Had you ever met her? Did you guys record in the same studio, or was that added on afterwards? Or 
we're all in the same room. They, at the, in those days, I'll just uh, run this by you. The uh, the way they did sessions was they would they would have the arrangements delivered to the session usually, uh, uh, and they had a copyist and that would do it very professionally. And, and with that session there, it was like a rhythm section, bass, drums, guitar, and uh, piano. And uh, I think they had, a, a, like the bass, they had another person playing the bass, but it was an octave lower than the guitar. And they played exactly the same thing that the bass played. Mm -hmm. And that gave it like a top end to the bass. Mm. And a lot of records at that time were doing that. And uh, it was all done. Uh, we did two other songs on that session. And then the way it worked was, they would mix it while you were getting your coat. <laughs> oh, <but. laughs> it was a very quick process. Yeah, so. I'll say. How how in the heck did a sixteen year old uh, navigate such a success of itsy bitsy teeny weeny? I'll talk about the teeny. Did that have, I'm sure it affected you. That was a silly question, but how did you handle that? Well, um, I have uh, six brothers. So I had six brothers and one sister, and so. I didn't have any big, you know, like a big inflated ego or anything like that. Because <laughs> they wouldn't let you. We were all in this little house, and, you know, we were just, you know, kids in the neighborhood. And, uh, but uh, it was just uh, one of those things. I was thinking the other day, this is 60 years ago, and 60 years ago, right at this point in time, I had the song Rosemary out, which was my first record. And I, at that point in time, I... I <laughs> I had no idea that in like a couple of months I would have the number one record in the country. And I was just thinking what I was thinking then at that time. Uh, I, and at that time, I, I was just glad that I had actually made the uh, made a record, made a, a record yeah, that was sure. possibly going to be on the radio. And that's as far as I was you know, thinking. And um, it, that was so it was a real kick to uh, what you what you asked. To have a, a record on the radio and uh, people buying it, and and then the kick, the, the ultimate cherry on top was, it it became a number one record in the country. <laughs> However, your sibling still still told you, Brian, it's your turn to take out the garbage. <laughs> they, would, they wouldn't let you get too big, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that you know, and that was uh, in my high school too. Uh, I, I'll just indulge myself here a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the record when the, the song Rosemary came out, I got booked on American Bandstand. To, to, uh, the record company got a, a slot for me to do that, and so told my friends in school, in Franklin K Lane High School, where I was going to high school. I said, "Hey, man, I'm going to be on American Bandstand next week." And because it came up really quick, mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, really, really. <laughs> <laughs> and so then that week, Dick Clark had to go to Washington because they had those payola hearings right. at that point yes, in time. Yes. And and he, so they canceled me. They canceled everybody from that week, I guess. And that was so when I uh, my friends in school, I said, "Yeah, right. We saw you. You were great." <laughs> and. Uh, how, so, you know, that was a that was just one of those things that you, happened. You did make it to to tell the truth though. Yes, I did. Well when Polka Dot, when It's Too Busy Polka Dot Bikini came out, uh, I did American Bandstand and I did the Saturday night show also, which was I I had watched that as a you know, a kid in New York. Uh, every you know, it was on every week at the Beach Nut show. And uh, that was really cool. And uh, <laughs> it's on then, YouTube at that by point the way. I started doing it. Started doing a lot of TV shows, you know, at, at that point. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose it, you could have fallen into that novelty act category, um, but boy, shortly after you you released bona fide pop records. I'm thinking of among other things, sealed with a kiss. Was that part of your strategy or your manager's strategy? You are not going to be, uh, you know focused on, you're not going to be a novelty act, you're going to branch out? Or was that something that just organic, well, it, or did that just organically happen? The, the things I was listening to before that were the Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly, uh, Frankie Lyman, the Teenagers, Jackie yeah. Wilson, mm -hmm. all the doo-wop groups who were around New York, and Dion the Belmonts. I that was that was in my head, 
And so novelty songs, you know, was just, I, I mean, I was lucky to have that one. It opened the door, but I didn't want to continue doing that. And then at that point in time, two writers, uh, Gary Geld and Peter Adele. Yeah, they were your guys, uh, right? Song, they, they brought it, yeah, they, they brought a song up to, uh, to Cap Records, and uh, I got to meet them, and they took an interest in me. And then they eventually, we, we recorded a record, a demo uh, of a song. Well, actually, we did the master of a song called Let Me Belong to You. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then they, we sent that, they sent that over as an independent production to, uh, and they signed me. Yeah, I, I so that was my exit, you know, into doing songs like that. One of, uh, like I said, I'm a first generation Brian Highland fan, and my older brother Bill, uh, he's actually the one that he had the job, so he bought all the 45s in the album. So I kind of, you know, <laughs> hey Bill, can I listen to this? Can I just listen to this? And when I heard uh, the Joker went wild, uh, I remember it specifically on the Phillips label. I said, wow, this is a cool song. You know, I really like this song. And my brother Bill said, yeah, that's the guy that did Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Patini. I said, get out. You know, and at that point, I, I, I knew that you were like really a cool, bona fide hit maker. I love I, that might be of your early songs, Brian, my favorite, The Joker Went Wild. What Thank you. you. What can yeah, you that, was a, that was a lucky break, too, that uh, after I. At the time, I was working with Gary Gell and Peter Adele. I uh, uh, think the music business and, and people's tastes had changed. And so uh, the, the record company, uh, uh, Shelby Singleton in New York, he was the, the uh, vice president at, at Phillips and Mercury there in New York. He suggested that maybe Snuff Garrett and Leon Russell could mm. come into New York and do a session with me. And they had a studio right there at the, at, in the record company, a really nice studio. And um, so they came in, and uh, it was like an all-night session, and we did a song called 3,000 Miles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, that, it, and that was like my first wor uh, uh, working with uh, Snuff and Leon. And so then <clears throat> that song, it did, it did, you know, it got a lot of attention, basically, but it didn't sell or anything. Didn't sell very many records, but then we, I did, they wanted another session, and they wanted to do it in California at RCA, RCA Studios, and so we went out there, and that was when we did the Joker Run Wild, hmm. and that session was unbelievable. We had uh, Glenn Campbell on guitar, we had two drummers, we had uh, uh, Hal Blaine and Earl Palmer, both hmm. who were Sounds... the top video drummers. This is the Wrecking Crew, I'm assuming, or part of the Wrecking Crew. That's right. Yeah. It was actually yeah. And the big bass player, Roy Pullman, and they had uh, uh, three backup singers. And, uh, you know, and then Leon played piano and also added uh, vibes to it. Yeah, and it just, when they ran it down in the studio, I, I listened to how it sounded. I said, this is going to be something. This is, this is not just an ordinary song. And it, it, the way that it, uh, it just sounded when you're hearing the playback. Mm. And... Um, what what are your memories uh, beside what you just shared with us? What are your memories of Leon Russell? I always liked him as a uh, well. I know he was big with Gary Lewis and the Playboy Productions too, but I loved him as a solo artist. But what do you remember about Leon and and also Snuff Garrett? Well, Leon, you know, there's a couple of people that I've met uh, of, of musician arrangers and like that that when they're on a session, everybody's on their best behavior mm. because. They, he's like uh, they, they all look up to him, and that was the, that was the case with Leon, also with Alan Toussaint. It was it, it was the same kind of yes, thing. Yes, sure. And um, but uh, with uh, my memories of Leon were when he, when I first met him in New York, he was very he, 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 he it seemed like he could play any any instrument. He we uh, he overdubbed a whole bunch of different stuff on that record, Three Thousand Miles, timpani drums. Then he did this other thing with it, uh, with the song that was the flip side of uh, actually of the Joker because we sung at the same session, and he slowed the tape down and then put a guitar part on, then sped the tape back up and it, it raised everything like an octave, and it sounded really unbelievable. So he had all these little studio tricks that he knew mm. too, and besides, you know, 
being also a good piano player. I, yeah, I believe he played on the. Wasn't he in the Shindig band? I think Leon Russell. I'm not really. He was. Sure. Yes, yeah, right. he was. Yeah. Okay. okay. I want to. Uh, I did. When I mentioned the Joker went wild, we have, um, of course, aside from here in the U.S., we have a very loyal listening uh, base in Australia and New Zealand. And after I had posted on social media, Brian, that you were going to be a guest, um, I would like to read a couple of things to you that they wrote about you. And this one comes from Jeff Brown in Australia. And he said, The Joker Went Wild by Brian was one of the first songs I remember where I would sit by the radio waiting for it to be played when I was only six years old. I loved it then and still love it now that I am 60. Really looking forward to the interview, Steve. So um, that worldwide, I mean, it was just, it was loved. And I have another another message from someone else in, in Australia. His name is Joe Mandica. As a matter of fact, Brian, he does my um, my theme song here on classic pop culture. And he's a pop artist in his own right, a great pop artist in Australia. And he said, talk about your influence, Brian. Steve, I always thought maybe Jeff Lynn of Electric Light Orchestra may have been a big fan of that song, as the verse of The Joker Went Wild always reminds me of the chorus of ELO's The Diary of Horace Wimp. So I don't know if that was ever been told to you, but um, your influence is, is, is international. And uh, I, I went back and I listened to The Diary of Horace Wimp and Son of a Gun. Yes, I, I do see the similarity. So wow. that, that's kind of be that's, that's a feather in your cap. Not that you don't I think that you've got you've got plenty of them as it is, but you know you continue to influence people. I'll tell you an odd story that uh, <clears throat> the guy that wrote the song "The Joker on Wild," Bobby Russell, yes. wrote "Honey," he wrote "Little Green Apples." He wrote, he's a really good songwriter, and uh, he told me that uh, when he he was driving home, and he lived in Nashville. And he was uh, in a traffic jam. There was traffic was just stopped. And he all of a sudden he got that idea. The Joker went wild. And he started thinking about it. And he had this whole scenario of uh, the Joker, the King, and the Queen, and you know the, mm-hmm. the whole playing cards. Then he he wrote a whole song on his way in the traffic jam. When he got home, he had the whole song. And so it was like just. Uh, it just came out like that. It was, that's a great, uh, great way to write songs, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 66, and I remember when my brain used to work, Brian. But, but if I remember, I think it was, uh, it was around the time that the Batman TV show was on, that that song came out. And I, when I first saw the title, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this has anything to do with Batman. Of course, it didn't. But you know, it was seemed to be like kind of karmic timing too that a song the joker went wild would be released at that time the you know it's funny you said that because <clears throat> when right at the same time when leon came into new york uh to uh to do that first session i did with uh, the song three thousand miles they also recorded a batman theme which was never accepted by the people that were you know doing the tv show and there was like a, the word out, everybody the word was out that if you get a Batman song for the theme of the show, do it and send it to the uh, people that were doing the TV show. And Leon's was one of those, and uh, it, I thought it was pretty good. But uh, mm-hmm. it, it what you know they got they went with something else. Yeah, I had uh, I spoke with Michael Z. Gordon. He was um, the founder of the Marquettes and the Routers. They also uh, a similar story. They recorded a version of the Batman theme, but it wasn't used either. So. You know, yeah, it's, it's funny how things. Now you know we mentioned a few, um, a few people that you worked with and worked with you. Could I just uh, go through a quick list and maybe you can give me a little thumbnail about each? Okay. Um, well, we mentioned Alan Toussaint. Um, specifically, um, your your album in a state of Bayou. Could we talk about that and, and your work with Alan? And, and again, it goes with my what I said before. You're just. You are such a diverse artist. What can you tell us about that 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 part of your uh, recording career? Well, I had uh, I was uh, in in Los Angeles and I was looking for songs, and uh, I went up to uh, one of these publishing companies. I forget exactly which one, and they had a demo which I heard 
of a song that Alan wrote called Freedom for the Stallion. And the demo took my breath away. It was so happy. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, it, I don't know, I think it was Lee Dawsey. And, uh, and I asked Alan how he got the vocal sound. Later on, I asked him how he got the vocal sound for the background. And he said they were humming. He said, wow. so they, uh, he got everybody in the office to hum this, uh, you know, this thing, because he had his own studio, uh, C Saint Studios. But he, they all hummed, uh, you know, in, in, with harmony. And that was the sound. I couldn't, I couldn't understand how they got that sound. But this is on the demo of that song. And I listened to that over and over again. I thought, no, oh, this guy is a really good producer. And I like, you know, what he's doing with all these songs. They're, they're, uh, so then he, anyway, so I, I, Actually, I just called up there. I called up and I spoke to uh, some of the people in the office, in Alan's office. And I had been doing these uh, shows in around Memphis with a band there. And anyway, so we just, uh, my wife and myself, we just uh, drove in there or flew in there. I, th I guess we flew in to, uh, to New Orleans and uh, we had a meeting with Alan. And we just said, you know, we'd like to you know, maybe do a session with you. And so we had, we presented some songs and, and, um, so it took a while, but eventually I got to do, uh, some original stuff and some tracks that, that, that he wrote. I, I, I know Ray Davis of the kinks. Uh, he had, um, moved for, I don't know if he still has a place, but he had moved for a while to, um, to new Orleans. And he says, it's just when you're recording there, that it is just a completely different, Plane, do you find that? Yeah, yes, it was. And they always had like they had a, they'd have a dinner break, and they would have like food you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it so tough to go back to the session. That was the, that was the cool part too, because New Orleans is really known for the uh, you know great food they got there, sure. and that was part of the whole thing. And it was a very relaxed uh, atmosphere. And with Alan, the way he works with the musicians in the studio, working with the, he would have the bass player come up to his office before the session, and then he would run down what he wanted to, the on the bass, and he would play. He had a piano at Steinway up there, and he would play, you know, basically uh, play a song, and then he would say, "I want you to do this, I want you to do that," and they all read too. They read music, so and he he wanted to get the feel with the bass player mm -hmm. and that was important to him. Yeah. Uh, you worked with JJ Kale. Right. JJ was, uh, when I worked with Snuff Garrett, uh, JJ was, uh, one of the musicians, go-to musicians for, uh, for Snuff Garrett. And, uh, so I, I, my first time that I worked with him was on a song called run, run, look and see, which was the follow up to the Joker went wild. And uh, JJ did a lot of work on that one. I think he was the leader on the session also. And um, so I kind of met him then. And uh, uh, over the years, I, <laughs> I call him up once in a while. And he was very secretive, by the way. You know, he oh, couldn't, really? His phone number was, it wasn't widely known. <laughs> and, but I, I would call him up and, uh, you know, I'd ask him technical questions. How did you, you know, what kind of echo unit is a good, you know, and, and he, so he had great advice because he was, really into uh producing his own records from top to bottom so mm. and so he had a lot of good information you worked with rick danko and garth hudson band yes uh that was a real odd i that we cut some demos out at their studio in gorilla studios in malibu and that came up because i had this song that i had written with my wife called sapphire blue and I, I thought, well, this might be a good song for Jennifer Warren's. And so mm. Jennifer Warren's producer was Rob Fabroni. And so somehow, I don't know exactly how, but I got this song over to him. And then I was, uh, I was uh, at Bobby Hart's house we were, uh, for a couple of days. And uh, so uh, I said, you know, you can call me here because there were at that time there wasn't no, there were weren't any cell phones or anything like that. So anyway, so about a day later, I got a call from from Rockford Burney. He said uh, that he listened to it, he liked it, and there was another song on there which they, he liked too. And uh, and he said also, uh, Rick Danko thought it was great because <laughs> wow. he was working nice. he was working with the, with the band. So then he said, why don't you uh, come out and we do a, a better demo? 
at Shangri-La Studios. Mm -hmm. So we went out there and, and and we met Garth and we met some of the other guys too. Mm. Uh, I think, oh uh, yeah, Richard Manuel was there. <clears throat> we didn't actually, he didn't work with us, but we saw him. And uh, but it was just basically Garth and uh, and Rick, and then I think Blondie Chapman was out there doing stuff too. Oh sure, yeah. And um, sail on sail. It was another, was yeah. You know, so we did we did a couple of demos there, and uh, but Rick was he was a wonderful guy, you know, real nice, real nice person. That's nice to hear. Um, did you ever meet the Beatles? Well, I was a Beatles fan from uh, when I first heard them. Uh, I was on tour with Little Eva, mm -hmm. and we were hearing their songs. This is in in the UK uh, in 1963 in February, uh, and they they. And they, they had just, I guess, right at the time, released Please Please Me. I was hearing it on the radio. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so when I got back to the U.S., I told for a whole year, I was telling people, oh, man, the Beatles are <clears throat> unbelievable. But it's like <clears throat> they have great harmony, They have, and it's a band. They, they write their own songs, and they play on their own sessions. It's like kind of like Buddy Holly, in a way like Elvis, too, with Elvis's band that he originally had. <clears throat> excuse me, where they sure. could, you know, work things out and uh and they they weren't running by the clock in, at the, on their sessions. They just they just did it till they got it. I see. And um the, and so I I imagine the Beatles were in a similar situation where uh, they, they they were given a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess after a couple of years after the Beatles were big, uh I was on a tour with uh, Peter and Gordon and so Peter Asher, he said, if you're ever in London, give me a call. And, uh, you know, so I guess a, a couple of months after that, I went over there to buy some, some shirts and different things and just to kind of see what was going on. And it was a, just a tourism kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I called him I called him up and he said, hey, come on over and uh, uh, play some records and, you know, just hang out. So I went over and he lived uh, in on Wimpole Street. Which was uh, the Barrington Wimpole Street, very uh, historic street, and uh, so uh, we listened to some records, and he played me some really cool stuff. Then he said, uh, "We're having dinner. You want to stay for dinner?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." And then I walked into this dining room, and it was kind of you know neat, medium sized dining room, and Paul McCartney was sitting there. Wow! So, <laughs> and so that was he's the only one I ever met of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, you covered Jackie Wilson, uh, his Lonely, Lonely Teardrops in the early 70s. Had you ever met Jackie Wilson? No, but I was on, I did a show with him in uh, at the Brooklyn Paramount. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in 1961. I think it was the back to school uh, special Murray the K had there at, uh, at the Brooklyn Paramount. And I had the dressing room right above Jackie Wilson. So, the whole time I was there, he played the song Hit the Road Jack like a thousand times <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> it was unbelievable. He really liked that song. Apparently, and, yeah. <laughs> um, but I watched his set, though. You know, I never actually talked to him. You know, he, he was he, you know, like he knew I was, he was on the show. But, mm -hmm. What was uh, it like seeing him but live? The, uh, yeah, the, the thing was that, that really got me about Jackie Wilson was I think a couple of months before that, he uh, there was some kind of thing, and some uh, a, a girl, a fan, shot him. And um, so when he was on stage, at a certain point in his set, uh, he'd grab his side like he was going to pass out, Goodness. and the audience went nuts. You know, it was like, and uh, you know, I think it's you know, I don't know if he's faking or what, but yeah. it was a great bit, though. You know, <laughs> went over really good. Ever the showman. Yeah, right. And another thing about Jackie Wilson, this is kind of strange, but Tommy Boyce uh, was on that show, and he was playing guitar for Curtis Lee, who had uh, Pretty Little, Pretty Little right. Angel Eyes mm -hmm. at that time. And so uh, uh, Jackie Wilson really liked that song, uh, Pretty Little Angel Eyes. And every time that when Curtis was on and Tommy would be on stage with him, and when they got to the bridge of the song, there was this little guitar thing that Tommy played on the guitar. It sounded really cool. So every time 
I, I would look around and Jackie Wilson would all of a sudden appear on the side of the street and he'd listen to that little bit and then he'd take it. <laughs> like clockwork. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was unbelievable. Yeah, but that was a great show. Etta James is on that also Jerry Lewis, Ralph Don, uh, Tony Mando. Um oh. It was really a good, uh, great show. Yeah, in the mid seventies, uh, Brian, you you toured the Southwest. Um, is that during that tour when you developed your interest and involvement in the Native American nation? Well, my wife Rosemary was a uh, she had Cher- she was part Cherokee okay. Indian, and so I was always you know ever ever since when we got married, she she told me that you know, and I always thought that was you know the greatest, you know, because mm. uh, I, you know, living in New York, I didn't really know any, you know, American, Native Americans and, uh, or not that I, that, that, that talked about her. But anyway, uh, we, we, I met a guy up in, uh, at the record company. It was either Dodd or Phil. Uh, I can't remember exactly. And, um, his name was Tom B and he had a group called Exit. And they recorded for Motown, and it was all like songs about the uh, American Indian experience. A lot of the songs were. And um, so at a certain point, uh, I got a call from them. They said, uh, I have this band Exit, and we, we'd, like you, we'd like you to do some shows with us, and we're going to play some reservations and some dates in the southwest, Gallup, Albuquerque, right in, the, in that area. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, when I went down there and did a series of shows with him, uh, you know, they would do their set and then they backed me and I would do, you know, at that point I had the song Gypsy Woman was a hit. And so that, that Curtis Mayfield that, cover. That, what, what really like, great Gypsy cover, by, was great cover by the way. Sorry. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Great cover, by the way. Gypsy Woman. Oh, loved your version. The, the, uh, I didn't know it, but Gypsy Woman was very popular with the uh, with the, the Native American groups that we uh, in the reservations that we played. And uh, I mean, here's another thing about the the uh, I talked to some um, guy Indian people, American Indian people out there in Gallup, and uh, they said that uh, I was talking. They were talking about American bands, and they, they said, man. Every day, we would rush home from the school to watch American Bandstand. <laughs> wow. You know, Brian, uh, when I uh, when I get to speak with someone who's a, a musical hero of mine, and I find out that the person's even better than I could have imagined, that is the case with you. And I, I want to thank you so much for be, being so giving of your time and being so open. And I just want to tell you, it's, it's, it's been a real, real pleasure speaking with you. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's easy to talk to people uh, like in d- doing interviews and uh, like yourself that, uh, that have an interest in actual uh, the creation of songs and uh, the, the, you know, the, just a little uh, inside things about the music business. And uh, that makes it easy for me to talk about. And I find that so interesting, too. Well, well, thanks for being so forthcoming. And, Brian, if that autobiography ever does see the light of day, I hope you'll come back on the show and talk about it with me. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Brian. All right. Classic pop culture. Classic pop culture.